The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade tells the story of William Penn and how he came to America in the 17th century and founded Pennsylvania, the colony that contributed much towards the achievement of our independence. This Quaker pioneer greatly influenced the trend of our national thought and the structure of our constitutional government. Always working for the betterment of humanity, Penn's ambitions may be compared to those of the research chemist, who is constantly striving to achieve a similar goal expressed in the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra plays Here in Your Arms from the operetta Dearest Enemy. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. William Penn, son of Admiral William Penn and Margaret Jasper Penn, was born at Tower Hill, London, October 14, 1644. Our story opens in the year 1680, when Penn is 36 years old. We find him at the court of King Charles II in the palace at Whitehall, talking with the English monarch and his brother James, Duke of York. Master Penn. Yes, Your Majesty? My brother James has given me your petition regarding the debt we owed our friend the Admiral, your late father. I hope Your Majesty finds the petition fair and true. It is painfully accurate, Master Penn. 
I regret to say that we owe your father's estate some 16,000 pounds. In fact, Charles, more than we can repay. Much more, James. The expenses of the estate have been very heavy, Your Majesty. I suppose, Master Penn, paying the fines of preaching Quakers is one of the heavy expenses of your estate. <laughs> they harm no one, Your Majesty. Unfortunately, the members of Parliament do not agree with you there. We were speaking, Charles, of the money we owe to the loyalty of Admiral Penn. I need no prompting, James. Master Penn, we have no money. But we do have land in America. I shall make you a grant of land in settlement of our debt. I'd gladly exchange my claims for a grant of land in America, Your Majesty. Excellent. And as you will be the only person who has actually paid for such a grant, I want yours to be the largest. <laughs> I'm curious to know what part you've selected, Charles. Here is the chart. It runs from the west bank of the Delaware River, five degrees to the western limit of Lord Baltimore's Maryland. It will lie between the 40th and 43rd parallels. What say you, Master Penn? Is that province enough? The province is large, Your Majesty. The opportunity is even greater. With your permission, I shall make it a holy experiment. Oh, do with it as you will. Only collect our customs duties, and for the rest you have complete freedom. Then I shall give complete freedom to all who go there. But I should like to have the naming of it. Your Majesty, I... I had thought of calling it Sylvania. The forest, uh... I would prefer to name it after one of the best friends I ever had, your late father. Suppose we call it, in his honor, Penn Sylvania. King Charles II signed William Penn's charter at Westminster, March 4th, 1681. And 37-year-old William Penn thus became proprietor of what was later to be recognized as one of the richest land areas in the world. Penn set about making plans for the settlement. And one day we find him in his lodgings talking with his cousin, William Markham. Cousin Penn, I was overjoyed to hear the news of thy great charter. Thank thee, cousin. Art thou ready to act upon it? Thee means thee wants me to go to the new colony? Yes, at once. I would send thee out as my deputy without delay. Into the wilderness, alone? <laughs> thou wilt not be alone. There are some Swedes, Dutch, and English settled at Newcastle and Upton. I would have thee talk with Lord Baltimore about our boundaries. Aye, I understand. And one more bit of advice. Be impartially just and courteous to those now settled in our province. And I would have thee especially careful in thy treatment of the Indians. In what manner should I treat them? Be grave with them in council. I hear they like not to be smiled at. I understand. Friend Penn! Friend Penn! Ah, friend Wood, what hurries thee so? Ah, great news, friend Penn. Wonderful news. Uh, does he know my cousin, William Markham, friend Wood? Indeed, yes. How does he do? Uh, well, I thank thee. And now... What is this wonderful news? A great company has been formed here in London. They make thee a handsome offer of 6,000 pounds. For what? A monopoly to trade with the Indians in thy new province. They cannot have it. 6,000 pounds is a goodly sum. Must they offer more? No one can have a monopoly at any price. Yeah. Except, of course, thyself, friend Penn. No, not even excepting me. There shall be freedom and equality for all. But, Cousin Penn, consider. Six thousand pounds. It will buy much that we need. I will not sell this birthright for any pottage. This great province came to me clean. I'll not defile it. I should have known it, Cousin. Thou art a true man. I mean to be fair to everyone, Cousin Markham. That is why I bade thee be most tender of offending the Indians. Make friendship and a league with them if possible. We must live at peace with them, and they with us. Yes, no other colony has been able to do that. We shall try as no other has yet tried. We shall treat them as ourselves. We cannot treat wild savages like our fellows. Better than we treat them, I trust. But that's impossible. It must be done. I am set on that. 
What provision has he made for the government? I'll send that to thee later, cousin. It would take much thought and care. It has pleased the Lord to give us a great country. I shall be at pains to keep his peace and freedom there. Penn's Constitution, finally approved in April 1682, contained several features similar to our own. In general, it advocated the protection of rights of the people. This most liberal of all proprietors in colonial America gathered artisans and craftsmen, and on August 30th, 1682, he sailed from Deal, England, on the welcome with a hundred passengers. Penn's first landing in his new province was at Chester. From there, he rose up the Delaware River in a barge with his cousin Markham. Great clouds of white heron rise into the sky before them, and the sun is darkened by flights of white ducks and swans. There's plenty of game here, Cousin Markham. Aye, not only waterfowl, but great flocks of wild turkeys and herds of deer and elk. It's a natural paradise. Our children will never want for food where the Lord has provided. Cousin Markham, are the Indians friendly? They seem so. I have told them all he said. They listened in silence, and I think doubtfully. Doubtfully? They cannot decide whether to believe thy words or friend Wood's actions. Is Wood up to some mischief? He uses an interpreter who creates misunderstandings when he bargains with them. I'll treat with the Indians at once and confirm what I promised through thee. They are eager to see thee. Ah, look yonder, cousin. Aye. Where the creek flows into the river. It makes a natural dock. Aye. We call it Dock Creek. It is a natural port. It's the site of thy new city. Good. We'll name the streets for the trees that grow there. We'll make fine open parks and commons. He has a plan for it already? Aye. Let every house be placed in the middle of its plot, so that there may be ground on each side for gardens, orchards, or fields, that it may be a green country town, which will never be burnt and always wholesome. It should grow into a rich and prosperous metropolis. May it always be a city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, is today built up as it was laid out by William Penn. Dock Creek became Dock Street, for many years the center of American finance. Symbolic of Penn's desire for amity and justice in his dealing with the Indians was a meeting which tradition says was held in the fall of 1682 at Shackamaxon Creek. There the leaders of the Lenny Lenape, or Delaware Indians, and some of the Susquehannas came to meet him, led by their chief Tammany. We find Penn and his commissioners in the Fairman House waiting for the Indian council to gather. The Indians are now in council, Cousin Penn. They are outside waiting to welcome thee. Thank thee, Cousin Markham. We'll go to them at once. Well, why not make way. them come to us? I'm afraid, friend Wood, that this house of Fairman's is not large enough. I'll follow after thee, Cousin. I thank thee. Look, Master Penn, how they sit under my great elm tree. Ah, is it not a fine sight? Yes, Fairman. Like all simple things, full of dignity. And they outnumber us three to one. I don't trust them. Don't let them see that, my friend. Or they'll not trust thee either. Why do they sit in three crescent rows like that? To protect each other? Oh, no. In the first row are the old and wise counselors. Behind them sit the principal warriors and landowners. And in the last row are the young men, who are silent observers. Witnesses for three generations. We must be careful. We must be fair. Who is the noble-looking old man in the center? Oh, he is Tammany, chief of the Delaware. He looks like a crafty old fox to me. He's tall and straight. We must take care these savages don't outdo us in nobility. Ita! Ita! That is their way of greeting. Ita! The Lord be with thee and me always. Shall we use an interpreter? Not if it can be avoided. I would talk directly with him and have clear understandings. They call the Ona, which means quill or pen. Ita, Ona. Ita, Tammany. 
I come to say, we want peace between you and me, between your friends and my friends. We have many governors past years. You first governor come talk face to face. We glad. You have been good friends. We love peace. We not like live in fear, hide and hunger. We want live like brothers. Tell me how we can live like brothers. Our young men say words we not like sometimes. We no help that. So with you. If you angry with us, we angry with you. First, you tell us why, then we tell you why. We talk. We make sure trouble not bad enough for war. I agree. In trouble between us, we make counsel for talk. Six Indians, six whites. They will decide what is right. Good. I tell Sasha Mackin. They have a beautiful language. What are they shouting for? What's wrong? That is their way of voting yes. Sasha Mackin say good. Then we shall live as brothers. As long as sun and moon shine in sky. We have broad path to walk. If Injun asleep and Yangi's men come, he pass and do no harm to Injun. If Yangi's men sleep in pass, Injun pass by and do him no harm. He say he is Yangi. He loves sleep. What does he mean? Is he trying to insult us? No, Wood. Can't you see? He means we trust each other. Friend Tammany, we agree. We are brothers as long as sun and moon shine. Let me take your hand on it. Oh, no, Sissy Moss. Who's correct? Who's correct? And now, we have brought presents for thee and thy friend. A famine. Aye. Unpack the cloth, the merchant. Aye, Master Sam. Now, Indians may candy call. What's that, Fairman? A sort of ritual and dance that follows a serious council. We sing how we like Quaker. A Quaker. Indians, brothers with Yankees. Yankees is about as close as they can get to English. By any name, we are their friends. Uh, words. Nothing but words. I believe it when I see it in action. I'll believe it if I'm not murdered in my bed. If we live by our word, friend Wood, then we can be sure where the blame lies if the peace is broken. Penn made 19 separate treaties with the tribal chief in which he purchased land. The Indians kept their record by using belts of wampum, beads, or rare shells, each belt standing for a clause in the treaty, and the Indian to whom the belt was entrusted was responsible for remembering the words of that clause of the treaty. Penn returned to England in 1684, and it was 15 years before he was able to return to his beloved colony. In 1699, he brought his wife, Hannah, and his daughter, Letitia. It is early December, and his boat is landing at Dock Creek. Help, boys! Ah, Philadelphia. It will be good to feel the ground under my feet again. Come, my dears. We're here at last. Anna, Letitia. Why, there are fine houses here. Did I not tell thee? Come, Letitia. I hope the houses are warm, Father. I'm cold. You'll soon be before a great open fire. Welcome, Cousin Penn. Welcome home. I'm glad to see thee, Markham. And a hearty welcome. The people are glad to see thee back. I thank thee all. Step carefully now, Hannah. Ah, There. This is our cousin Markham. How does thee do? How does thee do? Now, Letitia, jump, child. Yes, father. Ah, my daughter Letitia, cousin Markham. Right glad I am to welcome thee. Thank thee, sir. Oh, father. Who are those painted men? They're Indians, Letitia. Be not afraid. 
He has been away too long, Cousin Penn. Things go better when he's here. Is Otto Miss with the Indians? No, no trouble so far. I'll renew my treaty with him. Is my house ready? I fear Hannah is overtired. Aye, thy house with the fine slate roof is ready now. And in early spring, we can go to thy estate at Pensbury. Ah, Cousin Markham, it is good to know I can rely on thee. And how is friend Wood? I do not see him here to greet me. I wish I had good report to make of Wood. He still worries about the Indians. He has a little daughter, Rebecca, born since you left. He tries to teach her fear of the Indian, but she cannot understand him. Then she has more wisdom than he. If there was but some way to prove to him that the Indians are our friends, that as we treat them, so they will treat us, without his constantly stirring up doubt, our understanding with our red brothers would be perfect. We must find a way, now that I'm home again. Come, Hannah, we'll soon be there. I, William. I want you to love the new world as I do. A month after landing, a son was born to Hannah and William Penn. They named him John and called him the American, for he was the only member of the Penn family born in the colony. By now, Philadelphia had several hundred houses, and a settlement had spread far inland. But George Wood and some of the others still feared the long silence and quiet behavior of the Indians. Penn was determined to renew his treaty with them in the spring. Before the great council was called, Penn is riding one day to the friend's meeting house at Heverford, west of Philadelphia, when a horseman comes galloping towards him. Oh, oh, steady, boy, steady. Pull up, friend. Oh, oh. Why, friend Wood, what does thee ride so wildly for on first day? My daughter, my little girl, have you seen her? No, I've seen no one since I left Gardner's Ferry. Is anything wrong? She's gone. We were at Thomas's. She was praying outside. When I came out, she was gone. She's been stolen. Well, who would steal thy child? Indians. They've been camping all around. Strange Indians. Susquehannas, Conestogas, Iroquois. My little girl's been taken by them. You have children. You ought to know what it means to have them stolen by Indians. It's happened often. Not in Pennsylvania. It has now. I'll not believe thee. I might have known you'd side with these heathen against me. You should give me help. I gave thee help when I made my first treaty with them. Words. I'll give them no words, the treacherous fiends. I'm for action. There are many in Philadelphia who feel as I do. I'm riding for them, and we'll kill every red Wait. Friend. Be careful what you're about. You'll undo all the good we've accomplished. I'm deaf to you, Penn. You and your talking has betrayed us all. Get up, Penn! Penn rides on in solitude with his thoughts. Though he is the proprietor of the colony, it has its own legislature and makes its own laws. Would they turn against his policy and destroy all he has built? He rides deep in thought and doesn't see an Indian softly approaching. Isa! What? Oh, Isa! How does he, friend? Oh, boy. Oh. What child is that you're carrying on your back? Quackle's girl. Where did you find her? She find us. She lost in wood. Me take girl to Philadelphia. Thank thee. Child, would thee like to take a ride with me? Very much, thank you. Put her up here before me on the horse. There we are. I'll take her to the meeting. You sure no hurt. Honest, good friend to us. I am honest. You, honest? Ha, easy, must. Uskele, you white man keep his word. Ita. The Lord be with thee. Ita. Come, get along. Nice Indian. You weren't afraid? Oh, no. He gave me a nice ride, pickleback. But I like horseback better. <laughs> What's thy name? Rebecca Wood. Is George Wood thy father? Yes. Does thee know him? Better than he knows himself. And if I mistake me not, hither he comes searching for thee. Friend Wood. Oh, oh. Thy child is here. Rebecca. Yes, father. 
Rebecca! Oh, what a fright you gave us. Are you safe? Nice man, give me a ride. Tell thy father, Rebecca, who found thee when they were lost? Nice Indian father. I do not know how to get home. He was bringing me back. He said Indian must take good care of Quakel's girl. Is this true? Aye. Rebecca must teach thee to trust the Indians as we do, friend Wood. For only in their trust lies the success of our colony. For 75 years, from the founding of the colony till the revolt against the mother country, the people of Pennsylvania lived at peace with the Indians. The colony flourished and prospered. Pennsylvania was more than a colony. It was a great ideal, a holy experiment dedicated to brotherly love and peace. DuPont is proud to pay its tribute to William Penn, brave and kindly leader in the cavalcade of America. that marked the patient progress of William Penn is reflected today in the work of research chemists who have contributed so much to better living in recent years. At a preview of an exhibit sponsored by the DuPont Company at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia earlier this evening, Dr. C.M.A. Stein, vice president of the company, emphasized that view in recalling some of the amazing changes wrought by the chemical laboratory. He pointed out the change from the old-time buggy-like automobile, once a luxury of the few, to the 20 million modern cars America rides in today. The change from the smoky old-fashioned stove to modern thermostatically controlled central heating. From former hot, sticky summer quarters to air-conditioned office buildings, railway cars, and apartment houses. These and many other changes that have given us a new standard of living have been brought about largely through scientific research. But, Dr. Stein said, the real significance of such progress is that research has made it possible for the average family on a limited budget to enjoy comforts unknown even to the wealthy just a few years ago. And with these scientific improvements and reduced prices have come other economic advantages. Chemical research, for example, has opened up new avenues of employment and created new jobs by creating entirely new industries. Chemistry has opened new markets for American farms, mines, and forests. And it gives us man-made products which render this country independent of foreign sources of supply for certain vital uh, materials. A good example of how research affects our daily life is the story of chemistry and textiles. For centuries, textile yarns were spun and woven by laborious hand operations. And although advances were made as machinery was improved, textiles were still unsatisfactory in many cases. The vegetable dyes used at that time faded. Fabrics were difficult to keep clean and often didn't wear well. Today, the chemist provides a brilliant rainbow of really fast dyes made from coal tar. Chemical bleaching agents achieve fabrics of snowy whiteness. Recently developed dry cleaning agents do a better job that costs you less. And various processes perfected through chemical research render cloth water-resistant, fire-retardant, or resistant to creasing without changing the feel or appearance of the fabric. That's just one page from the story of chemistry's contributions to the textile industry. And it's the same story in many other fields of human activity. Speaking of what the future holds in store, Dr. Stein said that only a crystal gazer would attempt to prophesy, but that new products and improvements in many now existing will surely come out of the chemical laboratory. For the record of research chemistry is progress, progress that has provided and will continue to provide better things for better living through chemistry. Next week, you're invited to tune in again when you will hear our dramatization of the story of Elmer Ambrose Sperry, last of the old-time inventors, same time and same station, when the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, again presents the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>